Our first speaker has been called a rock star in the open access movement. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Nick Shockey, Director of Programs and Engagement for SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, and Founding Director of the Right to Research Coalition, R2C. R2RC, which is an international alliance of local, national, and international student organizations that advocate for researchers, universities, governments, and students themselves to adopt open scholarly publishing practices. Supported by SPARC, R2RC has grown to represent just under 7 million students in more than 100 countries who are engaged with open access initiatives. Prior to joining SPARC, Nick worked as a student activist for the causes of open educational resources and open access. He worked locally to make Trinity University the first small liberal arts university in the United States to pass an open access policy. He also worked nationally with SPARC in launching its student campaign. Nick was named a SPARC innovator in 2007 for his work with students. Although he has spoken all over the world, Nick has not yet experienced a TWU welcome. Please join me in giving Nick Shockey a warm welcome to the podium. Well, it's clearly all downhill, all downhill from there. I don't know how I can look at being a rock star. I'm not sure who I inadvertently paid for that. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic to be here. Um, this is not my first time to Denton. I actually spent the summer here um, when I was in high school at UNT, just down the road. Uh, but it's good to be, be back at Denton. I actually have a few friends that are here. Um, so I guess this evening I want to talk to you a bit about both open access to research articles um, sort of why this issue is important, how you can make your work openly available, as well as open educational resources, so openly licensed free textbooks. Um, but before we get started, I want to point out a couple of things. One is that this presentation uh, is openly licensed under uh, a Creative Commons attribution only license. And I'll explain why that's important in the presentation itself. So anyway, this presentation is actually already online at bit.ly slash TWU open access if you want to download it now. You've already sort of heard about the two organizations that I represent, uh, but just to give you a little bit of additional background on Spark in particular, uh, Spark is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. It's a mouthful. It's a very good thing we have uh, a nice pithy acronym. Uh, but essentially, it's uh, a coalition of libraries uh, that uh, sort of represents the library community's interest in making a more open and more sustainable uh, system of scholarly communication. Um, and we'll talk about the sustainability part in just a minute. Uh, but a large part of work, what Spark has done over the last, uh, particularly five to six years, uh, is a lot of public advocacy in Washington, D.C. for good public policy, uh, particularly requiring that any federally funded research uh, be made openly available within 12 months. Um, and then, as you already heard a little bit, uh, what I've really spent most of my time um, working on over the last five years is this organization called the Right to Research Coalition, which is an international alliance of student organizations of all sorts of uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, that collectively represent about 7 million students in a little bit over 100 countries. And it's everything from student governments here in the U.S. So if TWU student government wanted to join, if there's anybody in the room, uh, more than welcome to. We would love to have you on board. And then it sort of scales up to larger organizations like, for example, the International Federation of Medical Student Associations, um, which is sort of the big Uber umbrella organization for all medical student organizations around the world. Uh, and they represent uh, over a million students, so one of our larger members. Um, so, the first problem that I want to talk to you about is one that I think most of you uh, have probably <laughs> experienced, but right? even at relatively well-funded institutions like TWU, um, you know, that spends over a million dollars a year, um, some of you might not know that, spends over a million dollars a year on just library subscriptions, um, but this still happens all the time, um, you know, even at well-funded institutions. And the reason is, uh, these things, the academic journals themselves, uh, well, they don't come with price tags, unfortunately. Kind of wish they would. So let's play a game. Uh, what do you think a uh, one-year subscription for TWU would cost for this journal? And librarians can answer, because I probably have a good idea. <laughs> Any guesses? 1500 1500 okay. We can do better than that. Almost 35000 5000 Yeah. We're getting warmer. <laughs> 
<laughs> We're getting closer. All right, we'll, I'll, Tim's good. Um, so it actually costs just shy of fifteen thousand um, dollars for TWU. But but hold on, this is actually relatively good deal when you consider that uh, a couple of years ago Harvard paid just shy of forty thousand dollars for their one year subscription to this particular journal. Um, so this is an admittedly extreme example, but. Um, the average journal price for an ISI index journal in a whole host of disciplines um, is really, really high. So chemistry is the most expensive uh, discipline where the average journal, the average, not the most expensive, um, is about $4,200. But you can see, uh, you know, it's so incredibly expensive for biology, for physics, and even uh, geography as a non-science discipline, over $1,300. Uh, and in fact, uh, a study came out in April, um, published by the Library Journal, um, that showed that there are actually over 15 entire academic disciplines where the average ISI index journal is over $1,000 uh, for one subscription for one year. It's just incredible. Um, and so when journals are this expensive, uh, you know, libraries, even well funded ones like at TWU, have to make uh, hard choices pretty quickly as to what they can afford to subscribe to uh, and what they can't. And so We've sort of gotten this way as uh, these journals have become more and more expensive over time. And in fact, uh, since 1986, we've seen the price increase uh, a little bit more than 400%, uh, which outpaces, outpaces inflation uh, by about two to three times. Uh, and so this is just incredible. And one of the other sort of things to take away from this graph is, you know, perhaps if you're a humanist or a social scientist, your journals typically aren't as expensive as they are in the sciences. But um, you probably care a little bit more about publishing monographs, so things like books. Uh, but as journals become more and more and more expensive, libraries have to spend more and more of their budget buying journals and not buying monographs. And so um, some of you may know that it's become increasingly difficult to get monograph published. And a large reason for that is because libraries, the demand for monographs is being suppressed by how much they have to spend on journals. And this problem's actually gotten so bad uh, that large international publications have started to take notice. So uh, two years ago, the Economist started writing actually quite a lot of articles about uh, scholarly communication and academic publishing. Uh, and they, they call academic journals, quote, a license to print money, which is crazy. Um, it's just insane. And it's crazy that, uh, you know, great major media outlets like The Economist are taking notice in the way they are. I think The Economist has run something like at least nine articles on open access in the last uh, couple of years. The New York Times runs articles fairly regularly, uh, as do international media outlets like The Guardian. Um, you know, and this sort of idea that academic publishing is a license to print money isn't something that's sort of, uh, that the commercial entities have missed. So this is a graph showing uh, the profit margins of a bunch of different companies. Uh, you'll see two on the right here, Springer and Elsevier, two of the largest commercial publishers. Um, and they're more profitable than AT&T, than ExxonMobil, than Apple, than Google, than Microsoft. Um, and this data is actually admitted by a pretty unique update. It's from 2008. Um, and, you know, there's been a pretty big economic crisis that we've gone through since 2008. You might think that their profit margins would have gone down. Uh, in fact, Elsevier is now 39% this past year, and their profit margins and revenue have increased every single year since this graph was made. Um, and this has essentially been a situation year in and year out for decades. Um, and so I think we sort of have to ask ourselves some hard questions. Uh, particularly, is there a reason why academic publishing needs to be this expensive? Is there something about it that makes it this inherently costly. My first word of it. Um, and I think the answer is, is, is clearly now for a, a number of reasons that many of you are probably familiar with. So I don't know if many of you uh, are familiar with PhD comics, but this is a great comic they did a few years ago, um, sort of pointing out how absurd uh, the academic publishing system is. Um, you know, so first, researchers aren't paid for their work when they publish in journals. In fact, in many cases, you actually pay the journal to be published, even if it's not uh, open access. Then you volunteered your time to do all the peer review for free. Uh, and then oftentimes you even serve uh, on the editorial boards of journals for nominal pay or you know, nothing at all. Uh, you know, so all these inputs uh, are free. And actually, about 80% of research is publicly funded in the first place. This is from a study that was done by HSBC. So that was all the labor involved, uh, largely voluntary. Uh, but the research itself is, is funded from public sources. Uh, you know, so I think. Uh, is and for commercial entities, it's sort of like the best business you can be in, right? Because it's sort of, uh, you know, all of sort of the, uh, this material is being given to you for free. Um, and then on sort of the other end with libraries, each article has got a real sense of its own uh, monopoly. You can kind of see, 
Mr. Monopoly and Dan Yarrick, right? Because to have an article published, it has to be novel research. And so your library can't stop subscribing to one journal because it's gotten too expensive because then, you know, the researchers and the students on campus can't get that article anywhere else. Uh, and so this is sort of like being in the coal industry. If the coal paid for itself to get dug out of the ground, um, and then you can turn around and sell it for whatever you want because each, you know, each thing is its own monopoly. So I think we ultimately look at the question of you know, whether our publishing system that we've been using, um, you know, the thing that we entrust to distribute the knowledge that we work so hard to create, actually reflects our values, um, you know, as scholars and researchers. Um, you know, and I think the, the answer is resoundingly no. I mean, if you uh, are looking for an article now, you you know, inevitably run into paywalls even at well-funded institutions. And we've gotten used to you know all these workarounds. My personal favorite uh, is one some of you may have seen uh, called uh, uh, I can have PDF. So if you can't get access to an article and on Twitter, you can tweet the link that you're looking for with hashtag I can has PDF. And um, people monitor this, and so they'll see if they have it, and then they'll send you a direct message and email it to you. So this is particularly my favorite workaround, but there are lots and lots of other ones. Uh, I also happen to know that within a large scholarly society that shall remain nameless, uh, that relies mostly on subscription journals, uh, they have an entire email thread uh, with fellows within that scholarly society. It's all to share links for articles they don't have access to, and a lot of those are two articles that are published by that scholarly society. Um, so we've gotten used to these workarounds, um, which you know, add a lot of friction to the system, right? So you have to be really sure you want that article before you go bothering somebody else who sends you a link or to go through the hassle of posting this um, you know, to Twitter or whatever your workaround is. Um, you know, but there are actually much more dire consequences um, in other parts of the world. Um, Right now, there's a graduate student in Colombia named Diego Gomez who's facing eight years in prison uh, for posting a manuscript online um, so that his fellow, he is an ecology uh, graduate student, um, so that other, um, other uh, researchers that work in ecology get access to it. Um, and he's uh, yeah, facing a lawsuit and faces it's six or eight years uh, in prison in Colombia for doing something that uh, you know, most researchers do in the course of a day. Uh, you know, sharing their research with colleagues so it doesn't doesn't come without um, without risk. Uh, so that's sort of the problem that we face with academic journals. Uh, so I'm going to change gears a bit uh, to talk about textbooks, which is something that many of you are probably familiar with the cost. So this graph looks very similar to the one I just showed you for journals, right? These, uh, this is the price increase since 2002 uh, of college textbooks, so about 82% are just barely shy of three times the rate of inflation. Um, this is all going to sound very familiar. These two things really do rhyme. Um, and so this has led to where we currently are, where the average student uh, spends about uh, a little bit more than $1,200 a year on books uh, and supplies. Um, you know, and I think most students can agree uh, that college textbook prices are way, <laughs> way, way, way too high. Um, you know, and I think people feel this uh, sort of most acutely and introductory. Uh, courses where you know the average price of textbooks is almost $175. Uh, you know, and in many of these cases, these are for courses where sort of the underlying principles of you know this, this introductory class are well established. Um, you know, but you can still see when you're over $200 to get uh, you know the most popular introductory calculus book. Uh, you know, you can save some money with used textbooks or rentals, but they're still uh, incredibly expensive. Um, you know, there are sort of new ways to access. Uh, textbooks that are sort of being hailed as trying to improve this problem. So, for example, instead of uh, instead of paying two hundred and twenty four dollars for this macroeconomics textbook, you can print it uh, for ninety dollars, which is a pretty good discount, right? But it, uh, you can see here, you will only actually get access to it for about one hundred and eighty days, uh, and so you better absorb all that information because uh, in less than half a year, it's all going to disappear. Uh, you know, and you have to ask whether that's really such a good investment. Um, you know, when it's just going to evaporate. Um, you know, these are constraints we put on ourselves, right? The thing that makes the textbook disappear is the DR and lot that they stick in it. It's not because you know there's any reason that the textbook needs to disappear, right? It's a digital copy. It doesn't really cost uh, you know anything to anybody for this to exist. And so, again, you sort of have to ask yourself, how did we get in this situation? Um, and again, it's somewhat similar. Uh, it's you know the reason is because the market for textbooks is broken because instead of students um, sort of having uh, the ability to decide for themselves what textbook they want and uh, you know the professors make that decision for them um, you know, which is a good thing right professors should be uh, in charge of picking what textbook is the most appropriate for their course 
um, you know, but it means that students don't have the flexibility to pick a less expensive textbook. And so it's allowed publishers to raise prices year in and year out, uh, very similar to what's happened in the journal marketplace. Um, and so we've gotten to the situation where students often um, you know, have to make really tough financial decisions to afford their textbooks, uh, or often forego buying textbooks uh, altogether. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question. Uh, how many of you have either uh, have, have students buying a textbook before? Because it was, yeah, <laughs> I wish, yeah, hopefully any other remote audiences, people raise their hands as well, because it's pretty startling. Um, and it's backed up by statistics as well, about two and three students say uh, that they've made that exact decision before, that they've foregone buying a textbook because uh, it was too expensive. And furthermore, about a third of students uh, have said that at some point in their academic career, uh, they've earned a poor grade because they didn't have access uh, to the textbook. Um, you know, you just can't learn from a textbook um, that you can afford. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a challenge that students not only in the U.S. but around the world face, um, you know, getting access to these textbooks that they need. And it material, materially affects, you know, their ability to get, uh, you know, an up-to-date and complete education. So, sort of looking at these two problems, uh, the final question we can ask ourselves, you know, how do we enable uh, everything that the digital environment makes possible? You know, we have computers that can replicate this information for essentially no marginal cost. Um, you know, how do we make a better system, uh, you know, that students and researchers can act, get access to the journals uh, and the, the textbooks and the educational materials they need? And so the solution that we advocate for uh, to solve this problem, take a dramatic pause, <laughs> is openness. You might have never guessed that. Um, and so what we mean by openness and um, open journals or, uh, or open textbooks has sort of two components. One is that they're free, which means there's no cost or no barriers that you can get access uh, you know, to the journal or to the textbook or whatever the material is um, without having to pay anything or register for something or sign up to an email list. It's, it's freely accessible online. And then the second, second half is that it's open uh, or openly licensed, which means that you have the right to fully use or reuse it. And I'll talk in a second about sort of specifically what, what being open means. Um, you know, the reason um, sort of this open part is important is because, as many of you likely know, as I know Gretchen's going to talk about tomorrow, uh, as soon as you make uh, sort of any sort of work in the United States and in most countries around the world, it immediately becomes bound by copyright, which means that, uh, you know, all the rights uh, to it are reserved. Uh, one of my colleagues has come up with uh, a great analogy that's really corny, uh, but I think it's apt, which is that uh, all rights reserved is kind of like call me maybe, and that you have to ask permission to use um, whatever work it is, and you know the author, um, you know, can say yes or no completely. You know, it's completely up to them. Um, you know, that attaches to any work regardless of what you do. You don't need to register for copyright. It's you know any work you have is automatically sort of imbued um, with copyright, which means that. You know, the default state is that nobody can do anything with your work unless they talk to you about it with some, you know, one with some exceptions for fair use. Um, and so sort of the solution to that, to sort of, uh, sort of hack the copyright system, um, are what are called open licenses. And so what these do are amend the terms of, uh, of standard copyright uh, from all rights reserved to some rights reserved. Uh, so it allows, um, you know, different types of open uses. Um, so people don't have to ask for permission. And so Sort of the, the best example of open licenses are produced by an organization called Creative Commons, um, which some of you may be familiar with. I always plug them and them on my laptop right there. It glows in the dark if you're wondering. Uh, uh, so they have an entire suite of open licenses that you can use. And you may have actually already seen these. Uh, many YouTube videos, for example, are uh, Creative Commons licensed. Uh, many Flickr photos uh, carry the Creative Commons license. And then uh, the uh, uh, Wikipedia actually also carries a Creative Commons uh, license as well. And so sort of a couple important features of these openly licenses are that they grant you permission uh, in advance, which means you don't have to go to the author to ask the license signals that you have, uh, you know, rights to, to reuse the material. It grants those to all users, uh, so the public at large, not just one particular group. Uh, they're durable. As soon as you license a work uh, with a Creative Commons license, it's forever, it's irrevocable. Um, which means when you see the Creative Commons license, you don't have to worry about whether that license had been uh, revoked. It gives you the right to freely and openly use the work, um, so you can use the work without having you know, to negotiate monetary compensation, um, and then use it for a variety of different ways uh, without having to, to ask permission. Um, and then the only uh, sort of 
We find it specifically directed at Bounds Attribution Only License, which I'll talk a bit more about. Um, and that all sort of Creative Commons licenses require our attribution to the author. Um, so whenever you use a work, you have to, uh, to cite the author in the way that they specify. Um, and so we'll talk a bit about what these mean in the context of uh, open access to research articles and OER right now. So um, sort of taking this discussion of openness and focusing on uh, open access to research articles, uh, I first want to define sort of this term open access, which many of you have hopefully heard by now since it's in the name of your repository. Uh, so what we mean by open access uh, or open access to scholarly research, sort of two things, there are two parts of the definition uh, and both of them are equally important. So the first is that you can freely and immediately uh, use uh, these articles. Um, so as we were saying, no, uh, no financial restrictions uh, to, reading, uh, to reading these articles. But then the second half that's everybody's important is that they come with full reuse rights. So they're licensed under what's called a Creative Commons attribution only license, uh, which means you can essentially do anything you want um, with the article as long as you cite the original author. So you can share it with colleagues. Uh, you know, you can, uh, I guess, probably the most exciting uh, thing that these reuse rights enable is it allows uh, researchers to actually treat the scholarly literature like data itself. So you can bulk download you know, thousands and millions of articles and then feed them into data and text analysis software and cover new, uh, new connections um, you know, that no researcher could ever, uh, could ever uncover because we publish about 1.8 million articles uh, per year, way, way more than anybody um, could read in a lifetime. And so we have these tools that can uncover these connections, but unfortunately most of the articles that are published every year are locked away under full copyright where they can't be fed um, to these tools. So uh, if you take away anything, so that it takes more than being free to make it open access. You also have to have uh, the open part. So there are uh, actually two ways uh, to make an article open access. There's uh, the first half, which is just publishing in an open access journal, um, and then the second, which is called self-archiving, or putting your work into an institutional repository like PORT, the Pioneer Open Access Repository. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with some open access journals like those published by the Public Library of Science, Frontiers, uh, Biomed Central, and there's a great resource called the Directory of Open Access Journals at doaj.org. It's a huge list of over 9,900 uh, open access journals that are currently being published. And this number is just taken off uh, in an incredible way. Uh, about five years ago when I joined Spark, uh, that number I believe was around 3,500. Um, so it's just shy of tripled uh, in about five years' time. Um, and there are actually quite a few open access journals that uh, are very have. Uh, you know, high impact factors. You can see a few here. There's often uh, a concern that open access means lower quality. Uh, you know, but that's uh, you know absolutely not true when you look at these journals that have uh, high impact factors. Uh, you know, I think open access is sort of just tells you whether the articles are available or not. It doesn't really tell you anything meaningful about the quality of the peer review or the quality of the journal uh, itself. So that's the first path, uh, and then the second is that. You can publish mostly anywhere uh, and then make your articles available through an institutional repository like the Pioneer Open Access Repository. Uh, there are actually over 2,000 repositories uh, that exist in universities around the world now. This number has also increased dramatically over the last five to ten years. Um, and some of you may have used other types of repositories like PubMed Central, uh, which is run by the National Institutes of Health uh, in the U.S. or the Archive uh, that's run out of Cornell University. So this statistic, I wish a lot more people knew, uh, but unfortunately they don't, which is that about 72% of publishers uh, allow for some form of self-archiving, either the pre, uh, the pre peer review version or the post peer review version, even the final version in some cases. So uh, you know, in a real sense, this problem of access, at least free access, could be over, you know, uh, at least a large majority of the problem could be over very quickly if researchers would just exercise the rights that are already being granted to them mm -hmm. by publishers by making their work available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so a lot of the research that's been published at TWU, either by yourself or colleagues, uh, is likely, you know, you can make it available through um, the Pioneer Open Access Repository without even having to ask for additional permissions. And I know we have Diane Graves from Trinity, uh, who will talk more about that uh, tomorrow and the success that Trinity's had. And, and flushing out and filling out the institutional repository. Uh, and this is the obligatory screenshot of uh, four, uh, <laughs> which is great. Uh, so I guess one important thing to know about uh, sort of the self-archiving rather than you know, sort of making your article openly available in, uh, in the first place is that it actually benefits you quite a lot as, uh, as a researcher. 
There have been, I think, over 3,000 studies uh, that have been done now that show that there's a very significant correlation between work being made freely available online and its uh, increase in the rate of citation, um, which in some sense is kind of the most obvious thing in the world, right? If your article is freely available online and anybody can uh, get access to read it, then that means more people read it, more people will um, um, download it, cite it, um, and build upon it. Um, but there's a lot of sort of really good anecdotal evidence out there. My favorite is from uh, the Queensland University of Technology in Australia, um, which was the first institution in the world to have a mandatory open access policy on campus requiring that any, uh, any research that's published by faculty members there be made freely available. Um, so you can remember that for the, in the uh, open access pub trivia, which there was such a thing. Uh, so this is some data from uh, from the, the repository. So they made, uh, they put that institutional uh, open access policy in place. I think you can probably guess when, right here, <laughs> 2005. Uh, and you can see how the citation rate for the faculty members just absolutely jumps. Um, and I know the, the poll anecdote is not data, but you can see this is uh, another researcher uh, that saw a similar increase. These are both uh, sort of mature, established researchers. Um, and then you can see it holds true uh, as well for uh, mid-career researchers. And so this, this data is incredible, right? This is what you want um, as a researcher. I don't think there's much else that makes researchers more happy than when their papers get cited. Um, and so I think a large part of you know, sort of the sales pitch for putting your work into an institutional repository um, you know, has to be you know, how it benefits researchers and increases their citation rate. Um, I just love the site. Anyway, uh, so we've actually seen a number of institutions around the world follow suit. Uh, and there are actually um, uh, almost 200 institutions now in 34 countries around the world that have these types of institutional policies. See, she, she's all for that. Uh, yeah, and this is just, again, seeing a tremendous growth rate, sort of like open access journals. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, there were very, very few. Uh, institutions that have these and they've really taken off. I think there are two or three dozen institutions in the U.S. Um, that, have, that have these policies now that require that researchers uh, make any articles they publish freely accessible through their institutional repository. Uh, and of course, Diane from Trinity uh, spearheaded the effort uh, on campus at Trinity University just down the road a little bit, uh, or a long bit anyway. Uh, <laughs> to be the, the first liberal arts college uh, in the U.S. to have an institutional repository. So she's a fantastic expert on getting these things passed, um, and I'm sure will be great tomorrow in giving you some sort of top tips and tricks for, for getting these policies passed. She actually got elected to the chair of the faculty senate, which also helped get things through, but uh, that will be awesome tomorrow. So if you want to learn more about institutional open access policies and what makes particularly good ones, uh, there's a really good guide, uh, sort of a best practices guide, uh, at bit.ly slash good OA that's actually hosted by the Harvard Open Access Project um, that talks about sort of the different types of policies, uh, what makes them work, which ones are better than others, which is a level of detail I will not bore you with now, but it is important, especially if you're considering, which I hope you will, uh, in implementing an institutional open access policy. So we've also seen uh, a large number of research funders sort of uh, jump in as well and put policies into place that require that research that they fund, the, the resulting articles, be made uh, freely accessible online, usually after some delay. And uh, the U.S. was actually a pioneer uh, in these types of policies. The National Institutes of Health in the, excuse me, in the U.S. has had a mandatory policy requiring that all, uh, all research that's funded by the NIH, which is about $30 billion uh, a year, the, the resulting manuscripts have to be made available within 12 months of publication through PubMed Central. Uh, and this policy has just been a tremendous success. It results now in about 90,000 articles per year being made freely available that wouldn't have been otherwise. And the use is in, it's incredible. Uh, it's just taking off more and more each year. I think uh, in a talk that I heard Francis Collins give earlier this year, I think they're up to close to a million users every single day, uh, unique users. Uh, and I believe the statistics, I think, I think it's close to two thirds of those are from outside the academy. Uh, which is just incredible. And I think that's the perfect illustration of how there's such latent demand built up for these articles um, that's unmet because they're so expensive. Um, so we've had a big policy in place since 2008. Um, some of you may have heard uh, the good news about last year uh, in 2012 in February, we were successful in getting the uh, Obama administration to, uh, to put uh, a presidential directive in place, expanding essentially that NIH policy to cover the rest 
uh, of the U.S. federal government so that uh, most uh, federally funded research in the U.S. has to be made available roughly within 12, within 12 months. We're now in sort of the implementation phase, um, and so it's not fully online yet, but it's a huge step forward and more than doubles uh, sort of the impact of that, that NIH policy. Um, we also have uh, a bill in Congress um, called the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act, or FASTER. We like good acronyms at SPARC. Uh, and essentially what this does is improve on that presidential directives. And so uh, it shortens the delay from 12 months down to six months. Uh, and then uh, most importantly, it requires that the art resulting articles be, ma be made available under licenses and in formats uh, that allow for their productive reuse. And so it starts to get at that uh, sort of uh, the question of openness and making these articles available not only for free, but also under open licenses so that they can be used uh, to the greatest possible extent. Um, and this is uh, an issue that actually students have had a tremendous impact on. Uh, they were uh, in many ways instrumental uh, in getting that presidential directive passed. Um, here's one of my favorite stories from, uh, from sort of the time we were working on this presidential directive uh, is that there was sort of a, a group of sort of leading open access voices that wanted to uh, co-write uh, an op-ed about, uh, about how the, the president should sort of put a directive like the one that they ultimately did in place. Uh, and they had a bit of a hard time because it's not that interesting to newspapers for a bunch of people that are known for liking open access to write an op-ed about how great open access is. Uh, but we worked with two student organizations, the National Association of Graduate Professional Students, uh, whose past president actually hails from Britain, um, and the American uh, Medical Student Association worked with their two presidents to, uh, to co-author uh, an op-ed uh, essentially calling for the same thing for the, uh, the Obama administration to take decisive action on open access, uh, and it was uh, accepted immediately and published within a week in the Washington Post, um, which is where you want to be if you want the White House to read your article. Uh, and so this was really helpful in sort of making uh, the case and sort of illustrating to uh, the administration that there were large organizations that were paying attention to this issue and they expected action uh, to be taken. And one of those organizations uh, in AGPS has actually done over a thousand congressional lobbying visits in the last five years on this issue alone and has gotten additional co-sponsors to uh, the faster legislation that I've mentioned. Uh, you know, has just really proven uh, how sort of impactful the student voice can be on this issue. So, uh, sort of finally, I want to ask, well, why does this matter? Why should you care about open access? Uh, and I've sort of got it boiled down to one story that I think is pretty good. Um, and it's about a 16-year-old uh, that some of you may have heard of named Jack and Draka. Uh, you may not recognize the name, but I bet more of you will recognize this image, which is him from when he won the, I think it was 2012 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, with a novel diagnostic for pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer um, that blew the current diagnostic test out of the water. Um, you know, it was thousands of times uh, cheaper, uh, faster, and more accurate than the current diagnostic. Uh, it's based on carbon nanotubes, and he essentially made it by accessing the articles, uh, by accessing what he could freely available online. Uh, a lot of the articles that he's talked about being instrumental in his work um, were published by open access publishers like the Public Library of Science, uh, he talks about how he used the NIH's PubMed Central database uh, religiously, uh, and so open access really did play a, a quite a significant role uh, in his discovery, and he's actually become an outspoken open access advocate. Um, and probably the coolest example of this is that uh, he was on the Colbert Report about uh, uh, Halloween last year and actually mentioned open access on the Colbert Report, which was awesome. <laughs> you have no idea where I was at a dinner that night, and. Uh, We'd worked with him beforehand um, to uh, sort of uh, you know, talk about what he might say if he had the time. Um, no, we were just giving him some, we've worked with Jack for over a year now. Um, and there's actually a really good uh, sort of discussion uh, that we filmed online that you might also be interested where it's a discussion between him and Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, about um, sort of the work that he did, the role open access played in it. Um, and sort of why open access is important, both from Jack's perspective as well as uh, from Dr. Collins. Uh, but yeah, no, I was on pins and needles waiting for this to air because, you know, they actually cut quite a bit of the interview in places. And so we knew that he said it, which was 
first good thing, but then we're waiting to see the final cut, whether it actually got mentioned. And uh, if you actually go back and watch, you can see like how we really worked to get it in there. But it was great to hear like this issue on, uh, you know, on a platform like the Colbert Report. And so I think Jack's like the perfect illustration of, uh, you know, the, the type of uh, sort of unexpected breakthroughs uh, that are possible when all this information is openly available online. And we want many, many more people like Jack, but the problems that if you're not at a you know, relatively wealthy institution, um, then it's very, very difficult to get access to these articles that you need to make the discoveries like Jack did. Um, you know, and I think we also have to recognize that the majority of the world's population is completely locked out because even within the U.S., less wealthy uh, institutions of higher education or even community colleges don't have millions of dollars to spend on journal subscriptions. Uh, and with the Right to Research Coalition, actually the majority of our membership is outside of the U.S. and we work a lot with students um, in Africa and Eastern Europe and Asia, South America. Um, you know, those institutions can subscribe to maybe, um, you know, a dozen, maybe a hundred if they're lucky. Uh, journals, um, you know, if they have anything at all, um, you know, and so the barriers that they face are just far, far, far more significant. And these are researchers like, uh, you know, like us that, you know, have the ability to do, uh, you know, groundbreaking research to make contributions who are just sort of completely locked out because of these price barriers. So uh, again, we're going to transition uh, to uh, open educational resources. So this is the solution to the textbook side of the problem. Um, and so what we mean by open educational resources, or OER, and again, this rhymes very much with open access to research articles, uh, are textbooks or other ac academic materials, uh, like video lectures, for example, or syllabi, uh, quizzes, uh, sort of any sort of academic materials that are published uh, online for everyone to use, adapt, and share freely. So again, not just freely available, but also made available under an open license so that you know, as a teacher, you can take those materials and adapt them to your class. So if you're teaching, uh, you know, from a textbook and, for example, if you're, uh, you know, teaching in, um, you know, uh, you know, an area and want to change the names of the you know, people in a word problem to the names of students that will resonate more with um, the population that you're teaching, you can do that with an open license or update the material if there's, uh, you know, information that's out of date or examples that have happened since the book was printed, you can actually go in and update the text. So. Uh, sort of the meaning for, uh, of open and OER means uh, we call them the five R's. Um, and those are retain, which means that uh, your, your book or of course material doesn't magically vanish after 180 days like the textbook that I showed. You get to keep uh, your copy forever that you can reuse uh, the copy so you can uh, you know, sort of do uh, you know, whatever you want with your copy of, of the, the learning material. You can revise it. Um, so you can update it in the way that I uh, talked about it. You can also remix. Uh, and what we mean by this is actually you can take two different open educational resources and blend them together um, to make a new open educational resource. Um, and then lastly, you can redistribute. You can take that course material and give it to anyone. Um, you know, you can freely give it away and then with the understanding that you attribute the author uh, as specified so that they get credit for their work. Uh, there are a few notable examples of different types of OER that you may have already heard of. Uh, there's MIT's Open Courseware program um, that I'm sure is probably um, one of the, the more familiar types of open educational resources. Um, you know, it's just been an incredible uh, success with over 125 million visitors and over 2,000 courses uh, being made available through, for, through that particular platform. Uh, there's also a really good initiative um, that you should be aware of that you probably haven't heard of yet um, called OpenStax College. And this is a program run out of Rice University here in Texas uh, in Houston. And what they do is they've got uh, a bunch of big grants from fancy uh, uh, charitable organizations like the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, and they take that money and create sort of professional grade, high quality, openly licensed textbooks. Uh, and so you can see some of the, the titles that they have here. And essentially what they do is, uh, I think they invest something like a million dollars uh, in each of these titles, um, you know, so that they're absolutely competitive with a $200 uh, commercial textbook. Uh, but it's openly licensed and you can get, uh, a, you know, you can read it online for free without registering for anything. You can always read it online for free. Uh, but if you want to get a print copy, as many students do, um, it only costs you about 30 bucks, which just covers the cost of print on demand. Um, you know, so you know, they have, you can see the titles that they have here. Uh, they primarily focus on introductory courses because those are the ones that have the highest enrollments. Uh, and so you uh, sort of get the most bang for your buck. Uh, you know, but if you have a class, you know, where 
500, 1,000 or more students are uh, you're taking it and you're using what was a $200 textbook, um, you know, when we replace that with an open license one, you know, you save tens of thousands of dollars immediately on that one course uh, in student costs. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you can do is see if any of these texts from OpenStax College match up with courses that are being taught um, here at TWU and consider replacing them. Um, you know, expensive textbooks with these. And obviously, the decision for that's always uh, up to the you know, professor, the, the person that's teaching the course, as it should be. Uh, but we've, what we found is that oftentimes when, they, when, uh, when professors rigor, rigorously look at these books, um, they see that they're every bit as good uh, and end up switching to them. Uh, and OpenStax in particular uh, has saved uh, a little bit over uh, $2 million in student savings um, just in the last few years uh, alone. And there's actually a really good resource where you can find uh, their titles as well as all other sort of high quality open textbooks called the Open Textbook Library, uh, which is run out of the University of Minnesota. You can see the links very small at the bottom. Uh, it's open.umn.edu. And again, uh, the presentation's online at bit.ly slash TWU open access if you wanna download it and pull the, uh, that, that link straight from there. Uh, and so this has uh, all of those openly licensed textbooks that I was referring to, and it also has sort of an Amazon style rating system uh, where faculty review these textbooks with a rubric and then uh, submit that to them so that there's information on the quality uh, of the textbook. There are lots and lots of other initiatives out there run at the university level to promote open educational resources. Um, there's an initiative that launched about three years ago uh, out of the uh, state of Washington called the Open Course Library where the state legislature there uh, invested a significant amount in creating um, uh, sort of course materials that would cost $30 or less for the 42 highest enrolled courses um, for their community college district. And over the last few years, it saved, uh, saved students about five and a half million dollars, um, which is many, many times greater than the original investment um, from the state government there. Um, and so these are just you know, one example of how open educational resources um, you know, very quickly repay the investment that's made uh, in them. And uh, another really good story from the uh, Open Course Library uh, that I'm really fond of is uh, when they put this thing up, they you know, didn't have any reviews yet because it was a brand new platform. And so they're like, let's pay some faculty. Um, you know, I think it was $250 to write review of the textbook so we can, you know, get some reviews populated in here. Uh, no, and it was, they were paying them just to review the textbook. It didn't, they, you know, were under no uh, obligation to actually switch to the textbook. But what they found uh, is I believe seven of the 11 faculty uh, that reviewed the textbook adopted it within a year. Uh, and then I think there were something like four or five additional adoptions from other people, uh, other professors who didn't review the textbook at all, uh, but had heard um, from other, you know, had heard that it was a quality textbook and that it would cost their students nothing if they used it online. Um, and so I think that's a good illustration of, you know, these really are high quality textbooks that all you have to do really is get faculty to look at them in many cases. And that sort of gets them over the barrier. Uh, you know, even considering paying um, some faculty very small stipends like $250 to review textbooks, sort of build, uh, you know, some credibility for open textbooks on campus. So uh, we'll go to the, uh, the third half of my presentation, uh, sort of what you can actually do to promote open access and open educational resources. So uh, on the open access side, most importantly, uh, just make your work openly available either by looking for an open access journal that's a good fit uh, you know, for your work or in the case that you can't find an open access journal that sort of meets your needs, uh, make your article freely available through the Pioneer Open Access Repository. Um, and remember that it benefits you as a researcher and you can look at the beautiful slides about the citation rate jumping up. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's sort of the most important first step. Um, then just raising awareness about what open access is, why it's important, why it benefits researchers, sort of the self-interest in making your work openly available. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a pretty good resource uh, for this that we partnered with PhD Comics on uh, about two years ago now called Open Access Explained. I think this is the coolest thing I've ever worked on for Spark because that's actually me. <laughs> it's so cool. It's like a life dream to have like a PhD comic version of yourself. I, anyway. Um, but then I have to be in it, so when I show it and hear my voice, it's awful, so it's sort of a mixed bag. Anyway, um, so it's sort of very pithy. Uh, a, very pithy eight minute long YouTube video. <laughs> but, well, it is about scholarly communication, so eight minutes is, I think, relatively short for explaining what open access is, why it's important, and um, why it's good for researchers. So 
Um, you can find it at bit.ly slash OA explained, or if you just search open access explained in YouTube, it's the first thing uh, that comes up. And it's actually, I think now just gotten over 210,000 views, which is pretty good for an eight minute long, eight minute long video about scholarly communication. Uh, but I think it's a good resource um, that sort of distills this roughly hour long talk into eight minutes that's much easily shareable and uh, infinitely more entertaining because it's illustrated by PhD Comics uh, and Jorge Cham's uh, an absolute genius. Um, so I think this is sort of a good resource that you can just send an email in an email to colleagues saying, I just went to this uh, kind of boring lecture about open access, but there's this really good video and you should watch it and then you'll understand everything. <laughs> but I had to sit there for an hour. Um, so that's uh, sort of, I think the easy, easy sort of first step. Um, sort of the next level up from that is to actually work to establish an institutional open access policy here at TWU uh, that makes all of the faculty research output freely available through the Pioneer Open Access Repository. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of times there are a whole host of misconceptions around what these policies mean or how they can be limiting. Uh, but they're really good answers to all those questions. So if you go to that bit.ly link I put up earlier, bit.ly slash good OA, that addresses a lot of these questions. Diane, who's on her phone right now. Uh, I'm doing that <laughs> So I was actually sort of her student at uh, Trinity. Uh, so I have to take this, uh, this opportunity when I get it. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, bit.ly slash good OA is a great resource for learning more about these institutional open access policies. Um, I think nearly uh, all of them re, uh, have a waiver policy so that if faculty are publishing somewhere where they, uh, where they can't make their work freely available in an evil journal, um, they can waive out of the policy so it doesn't restrict their choice of publication outlet. Um, this is also something that uh, graduate students in particular have gotten uh, really active on. We work with students in uh, well over a dozen institutions all around the world and uh, in all across the US, Canada, uh, Africa, and Europe. Um, to advocate for these institutional open access policies. And actually last year uh, in July, uh, the PhD candidates in Stanford's Graduate School of Education actually passed uh, an institutional open access policy for themselves. So they voted on it to apply to all graduate students um, there uh, by 97% margin with more than uh, half of the PhD candidates there voting on it. Um, so that's just one example and something that maybe the graduate students here might consider. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, really inspiring to see graduate students take the lead on this, this issue. And that's one of the sort of the best examples that we had last year. Uh, another great thing coming up in a month, I can't believe we're so close, uh, is International Open Access Week, which is the last full week in October, the 20th through the 26th. Uh, and they're sort of, it's a time for open access advocates all around the world. Uh, to sort of celebrate open access and to sort of hold events raising awareness about what it is and why it's uh, why it's important. And the theme this year is actually Generation Open. And so it focuses on particularly the importance of students and early career researchers uh, and open access and sort of the role that the next generation plays uh, sort of as being uh, the ones that will ultimately determine, um, you know, the success or failure of the open access movement as the future generation of researchers. Um, so especially a good time for, for students to get involved. Uh, we've seen lots and lots of really incredible student-run projects around International Open Access Week. My uh, personal favorite, uh, to the extent that I'm allowed to have a favorite, uh, uh, comes from an organization called the Medical Students Association of Kenya, um, which in 2012 uh, managed to educate, uh, I think, mm, it's a little bit more than half of all Kenyan medical students in one week about open access uh, by holding events in, I think, all of the medical universities there. Uh, it's just, just incredible work. Uh, and we've seen other organizations uh, start to sort of make similar efforts, but it's just been uh, incredible to see how students have really taken this uh, and run with it. The other project that I want to plug uh, that I think is one of the most exciting uh, projects uh, sort of in the open access community at all uh, is this one called the Open Access Button, which was built by two British medical students uh, who built it in less than nine months. Uh, at the beginning of which they had no idea what open access was. Um, heard about it, had this idea, built it with no coding experience. Um, and this incredible tool, so what it does is it's uh, a tool to map, uh, sort of the two parts, it maps collisions with paywall. So you use the button to, you know, you click it whenever you hit a paywall and it actually maps where you hit it and what article you were looking for. Um, and then it also helps you connect with a freely accessible copy of that article if one's available. Uh, and so sort of the way it works is if you're, uh, browsing, you know, looking for an article, come across one that you don't have access to. 
Um, you can see here, if you click on it, uh, it costs, what is it, $35 for 48 hours of access. Just incredible. Um, so you just go up here and you click the open access button and it pops up and automatically scrapes the URL, the DOI, the description of the article. Um, you can uh, allow it to detect your location or not. Um, and then it actually allows you to talk about why you wanted to get access to the article as their British medical students who are trying to save lives, damn it. Uh, but you can write whatever you want. And it's incredible the stories that they collect with this. Uh, just to see the sort of uh, unexpected uses that people uh, have for these, these research articles. So you click submit. I love <laughs> They're hilarious. Uh, it's clearly a student run project. Uh, so you click submit. Um, you know, it sort of encourages you to tweet about hitting the paywall. Uh, and then it does some sort of sophisticated uh, searches on Google Scholar to help you try to find uh, a freely accessible version of that article. Um, that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so this is a perfect illustration of why it's important to put your work into the Pioneer Open Access Repository, because it looks for it by the DOI and it's available through the Pioneer Open Access Repository, then it can connect you to it. Um, and sort of that's what it looks like. It creates these beautiful yet disturbing images um, where, you know, this I think is at University College London, um, where they have lots of people using the Open Access button and you can click on each of the little closed locks and uh, look at why the person was trying to get access to the article. Um, and I'm really excited um, to say that they're actually going to be launching a new version of the Open Access button in a month uh, during International Open Access Week. Um, and uh, I'll give you a sneak preview, though it's not exactly public knowledge, but I, they wouldn't mind. Uh, one of the new sort of uh, bits of functionality they're going to roll out that I think is incredibly exciting uh, is an automated email the corresponding author function that will automatically scrape the corresponding author's email address, have uh, sort of stock text for say, please send me this article uh, that you can send with a click of a button with a recapture so that it's not abused, um, which is I think really, really uh, useful. But it will actually go a step further, um, and this is what I'm really excited about. I will also uh, include instructions for the author to send, uh, to provide a link to a freely accessible version of the paywalled article, um, you know, either in a repository or posted to a website. And so if they, you know, you know they'll say something along the lines of, um, you know, if you provide us a link, we can serve that link up to every, every other person that hits this paywall and is trying to read your work. Um, so that after, you know, they, we get that link back from the author, then the open access button can serve that link to every uh, single additional person that's looking for the article through the button. I think it's really powerful in the way that it sort of pushes authors to make their work available because it says, hey, there's somebody trying to get access to it. If you take this one small step, then anybody else in the future that's looking for your work can find it. Uh, and this is, again, entirely student-led. It was conceived by two, uh, essentially, what would be undergraduate level students in the US, uh, one of which I'm very happy to say uh, we've been able to lure away and is now the assistant director of the Right to Research Coalition, Joseph MacArthur. Uh, who's tremendous, but uh, yeah, it's just an incredible illustration of sort of the power of what, what students and uh, young people can do on this issue. So uh, for OER, the final portion of sort of what you can do to promote OER here uh, at TWU and uh, in the country, uh, again, very similar to what we just went through with open access, uh, you know, first of all, just raise awareness about the fact that there are these beautiful, openly licensed, high quality, professional grade open textbooks like those from Open Sex College um, you know, available that we, uh, that professors can use that will save students tens of thousands of dollars. Um, there's a great faculty statement on open textbooks that was put out by one of our member organizations, these student public interest research groups, um, you know, that you might consider, uh, you know, asking faculty to sign, essentially just saying that they will uh, agree to consider or look at openly licensed textbooks where they exist for classes that they're teaching. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent that it's interesting for TWU, you know, paying small stipends for faculty to review open textbooks is another really good way to raise awareness, uh, you know, and for, you know, only the investment of maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars, you could potentially save students, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the first semester alone. So I think in terms of return on investment, it's just about the best thing that I've seen. Uh, so sort of taking the next step, uh, you know, supporting faculty adoption, which um, you know, can range from anything from having, um, you know, librarians help support faculty in finding uh, high quality open educational resources that they can use, uh, or even paying small stipends to faculty 
um, to create OER or to adapt OER that currently exists for their classes. And there are lots of universities that are starting to do this. Uh, for example, uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst Libraries has a fairly uh, ambitious program to this extent that's actually saved students over a million dollars um, just at UMass Amherst alone. Uh, and there are lots of other examples like this from uh, other types of institutions. Uh, there's, uh, the, I believe it was Tacoma Community Colleges uh, had uh, a program called Liberate 250K where they hired an open educational resources librarian. Uh, and I believe it was actually the students that paid for it um, to help uh, sort of encourage the use of open uh, educational resources. And they liberated 250K very quickly and now they've gone on to loftier goals. Um, and there's actually a full list of um, these types of open uh, educational resources projects at this uh, relatively unfriendly long link. Uh, but again, presentations online, you can find it there. Um, then uh, you can also support the creation and improvement of open educational resources. So that includes sort of the, the, the work that I was just mentioning in terms of paying faculty small stipends um, to either open educational resources that they have or adapt uh, open educational resources that are already out there to uh, a class that they're teaching. Uh, but there's also an opportunity to work at the state and federal level uh, on this issue. Uh, two years ago, uh, the state of California invested, I believe it was $5 million uh, to put towards the creation of openly licensed textbooks uh, for the highest enrolled courses in California, um, you know, similar to what the, the open ta open stacks textbooks look like. Uh, and so state governments are starting to invest in this. There's a similar program that was launched um, a little bit after this one by the province of British Columbia uh, that's trying to put together open educational resources for their highest enrolled courses. The uh, province of Saskatchewan's also followed suit. Uh, and uh, there's also movement on this uh, in Europe as well. Um, we also have a bill at the federal level, uh, the Affordable College Textbook Act, um, which would set aside federal funds uh, to create openly licensed textbooks. And I think there's an incredibly strong public uh, policy case uh, for this because the U.S. government uh, both directly and indirectly spends millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars on textbooks every year through Pell Grants and other types of financial aid. Uh, and so if you just redirected a portion of that money that we're spending every year to rent access to produce high quality professional grade open license textbooks that can be then used um, you know, by all students across the country uh, for free. Uh, you know, I think as you'll, you've seen from these other examples that I've, uh, I've shown, um, you know, that it would pay for itself quite quickly. And so we're working to try to, to try to set aside some money in the federal level to do just that, though it's, it's quite, quite difficult these days. Um, then also institutionalizing support for open educational resources. Um, so essentially what this means is um, just showing support at the institutional level. So that can take the form of, for example, hiring uh, an open educational resources librarian um, you know, specifically tasked with helping faculty uh, adopt or create open educational resources, uh, or it's sort of a, an easier first step, uh, you know, is just putting a statement out there uh, from the university saying that the university itself, uh, you know, supports open educational resources, encourages faculty members, uh, you know, to look at uh, open educational resources where they exist uh, for courses and are a good fit. So, the last thing I just want to plug, uh, almost to the end, uh, is a meeting that we're hosting in DC uh, in just under two months now, which is terrifying because it's coming up quickly, but it's called OpenCon, and it's a meeting specifically for students and early career researchers on not only open access and open educational resources, but open data uh, as well. And so the idea here is to bring in uh, about 175 participants from all around the world that are sort of the leading um, or most active students and early career researchers that are pushing open access, open educational resources, and open data within their own organizations and institutions, um, you know, to talk about their projects, to support the ones that are already happening, catalyze new ones. Um, and uh, you can find out more about the conference at opencon2014.org. Um, it's a really unique conference in, this, in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that we're actually paying uh, all of the cost of attendance for almost every single attendee. Um, and it's going to be really strange in the fact that we're paying for almost all the participants and all the speakers are paying for themselves so that we can bring more students. It's, it'll be interesting, but good. Um, but the flip side of that is because of the demand, um, there wasn't an open registration process to, uh, to attend. Um, you had to apply when, fortunately, the window's already passed. It was uh, back in August. 
but we'll be live streaming the, uh, the entirety of the plenary sessions on November 15th and 16th. Um, so you can watch it remotely. And we're actually working with partners uh, on every continent to host satellite events um, to the meeting. So if this is something that's interesting, you could even consider hosting a satellite event um, and either participating live during the 15th and 16th, or we're gonna make the recordings uh, of all the panels and workshops available as quickly as possible afterwards. And so many of them will be time shifted and happen you know, a week to two weeks afterwards. Uh, and the demand that we saw for this was, was incredible. This is the first year we've done um, this meeting. And in the three week application process, uh, we received more than 1,700 applications from 125 countries representing 142 nationalities, covering a very large chunk of the world. Um, and so it was honestly sort of overwhelming and really inspiring to see the sort of demand and interest and passion um, there is for this issue. Um, you know, among the student and early career researcher communities. And we've been really lucky to work with really great partners like the Max Planck Society, eLife, which is an open access journal, PLOS, the Public Library of Science, Wright Law Tech, Microsoft Research, and dozens of universities um, that have sponsored this meeting that are, you know, giving us the financial support um, that it's gonna take to bring in these students. I think we'll probably end up uh, bringing in students from about 45 different countries. And so it's been incredible to see not only the interest, but also the support from the community to provide the resources that it takes to bring in these students, uh, regardless of their financial circumstances. So uh, with that, on the 104th slide, I apologize, I use a lot of them. Um, thank you, this is my contact information. Please send me any questions that you have or tweet them uh, at me if I miss your email. And um, you can find more about all these projects at writetoresearch.org or spark.arl.org. And I think we have at least a couple minutes for questions. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> so that's the first question. <laughs> I actually have a question, and it's a question I've been asked by faculty and actually a dean also, which is how can they tell a quality peer-reviewed open access journal from those they get solicitations for yeah. unsolicited in the mail? Yeah, so I think you know, there is uh, a concern around the quality of... Uh, we might have to that. So, uh, the question was uh, sort of to asking me to address uh, the sort of perceived quality issues around open access journals and whether they're sort of of inferior quality. Um, and again, I'll, I guess reiterate what I said in the beginning, which is that I think open access just tells you the business model. Uh, it doesn't tell you sort of anything about the quality of the journal. So there great open access journals, like there are great subscription access journals, and there are bad open access journals, the same way that there are bad uh, subscription-based journals. Um, so I think in terms of judging quality, um, you know, there are uh, a few ways to do that. There is uh, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, or OASPA, which is the professional trade association for open access uh, scholarly publishers, and they have stringent membership requirements. Uh, and so sort of, I think the best first step is to look at whether they're uh, the, the uh, publisher of the journal is a member of OSPA. Uh, and if not, then I think that raises a lot of questions um, since you know, the big uh, reputable open access journals are. Um, so I think that's the first stop. You can look at other resources that are out there. Um, you know, that there's uh, a guy named Jeffrey Beal um, who has Beal's List, which is sort of his own personal list of um, what he calls inferior open access journals, um, you know, which you know, could raise flags though. Oftentimes there are, uh, it's you know, sort of his own personal project. There aren't really checks on what goes on that list and what isn't. So, um, you know, it might be one metric, but, um, you know, there have been journals on there that have come off um, that um, really probably shouldn't have been on there in the first place. But I think, you know, faculty should do what they do, you know, in evaluating the quality of a journal with what they would do for a subscription-based journal in terms of looking at who the editorial board is, looking at what articles have you know, been published in that journal before, and sort of the normal types of due diligence. You know, I think there are serious you know, issues with peer review, but I don't think um, you know, there's, these are unique to open access. Um, you know, there have been, you know, some of you may have heard of the study that was published in Science, I believe it was last year, um, that was sort of a sting operation for open access journals where they sent sort of gibberish articles that kind of sounded real. Um, to uh, over 100 open access journals. Uh, and some accepted that, some rejected it, like the Public Library of Science rejected it. Um, you know, but, uh, a fair number of them did accept it. Uh, but this study uh, didn't send these articles to any subscription-based journals. And this was published in Science, and some of you may have uh, sort of identified the glaring flaw in their methodology and not having any kind of a control group. Um, but it got published in Science. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I don't, you know, 
I don't think it's really a sort of sound uh, you know, piece of research into whether that open access journals are a problem. It's just sort of uh, anecdotal. Um, but I think, you know, checking if they're a member of OSPA and just looking at the journal's editorial board and sort of the content they've published, um, you know, sort of the, the best ways to, to avoid low quality journals. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I have this fear. Um, Open access, you know, and I have no problem with that, but it's, you know, there's the policy which is open and free access to do, to do what you want with. And there's always that, there's that caveat at the end said, so long as you give uh, attribute to the author, but I wonder how many people miss that last part of it. They say, oh, it's open and free access, I can do whatever I want, and then they forget this, they don't, like they have to cite the author or authors of the, of the publication. So I think... That issue is uh, actually kind of similar to the open access, the previous question, which is that I think that's a problem um, that exists independently of open access, that that's just, you know, citing things properly is just, you know, proper behavior in the academy, um, you know, that you're not plagiarizing people and that you're giving citation where it's due. And so I think, you know, people that are inclined to not give proper credit um, are likely to do that regardless of whether it's published in an open access journal um, or not. Um, so, you know, I think it's pretty clear, um, you know, that citations required when you're borrowing, um, you know, sort of the, the ideas of other people regardless of, um, you know, whether it's freely accessible online or not. You know, I think the you know, other checks against that, that sort of, uh, that behavior. Um, you know, and if somebody takes your work and does not cite you, a Creative Commons attribution only license gives you the tools that you need to, uh, you know, to enforce your intellectual property rights against people that do that. Um, you need to either have them take their work down um, you know, or make sure that you're properly cited. You know, you have your, essentially your full suite of remedies um, for that particular question of attribution with under a Creative Commons license. So you still have those rights, um, you know, if you have to take action on them. Yeah. 